Let's talk about the Kleisen condensation reaction, pioneered by Rainer Ludwig Kleisen. How's that for pronunciation? The simplest Kleisen condensation reaction we can take a look at is with ethyl acetate. All right, this is an ethyl group, and this is the acetate portion, and this is an ester compound. So with ethyl acetate, what we can do is expose it to sodium ethoxide, uh, dissolved in ethanol, and following up with an aqueous workout, what we observe here is what's called a beta keto ester, where this could be considered carbon one. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the ketone on the beta position. You also notice that this compound has four carbons and ethyl acetate has two. So at some point, ethyl acetate combined with itself in this case and gave rise to a four carbon compound, the beta keto ester. Also notice that ethanol was driven off. The Kleisen condensation compared to the aldol condensation has a few differences. They both involve enolates, they both involve nucleophiles and electrophiles, that's understood. But with the Kleisen condensation, the mechanism tells us the difference. Whereas in the aldol condensation, we had nucleophilic addition of enolates to carbonyls. Well, in this case, the Kleisen condensation is nucleophilic acyl substitution. The nucleophilic ester compound, the ester enolate, will nucleophilically attack another ester compound and drive off the leaving group. That's where we see ethanol here. Before we jump into the mechanism, let's understand these reagents here. If we had a methyl acetate here, or methyl ester in other words, we would use methanol and sodium methoxide just by convention. The best solvent for the ethoxide here is its conjugate acid, ethanol. You might be wondering, why don't we use hydroxide? Why are we using the eth oxide or the meth oxide or whatever alcohol component of the ester? Why are we using those bases? Well, you'll recall that if we have an ester molecule, let's say ethyl acetate, and we expose it to hydroxide base, where water is the solvent, we actually have an irreversible hydrolysis. We call this reaction saponification, where we generate the carboxylate and ethanol as a byproduct. So we don't use hydroxides because of the fear of the hydrolysis pathway. So to avoid hydrolysis, we use these bases. Now one difference with the esters is that they aren't very acidic. The pKa of these alpha protons right here, in this case we have three of them, is about 25. Not as acidic compared to aldehydes and ketones, specifically in the ketone territory, those alpha hydrogens, let's say on acetone, are lower than 25, significantly lower than 25. Let's call it approximately 21 in terms of pKa. We also understand that if we have sodium eth oxide exposed to ethyl acetate, this is actually the first step in the mechanism, where here's our ethoxide base, negative charge on the oxygen. Let's highlight one of these alpha hydrogens. We understand the acid-base reaction will occur. The ethoxide base reaches out, plucks off the acidic proton, and we generate the enolate. Well, the problem is this. We've generated an ethanol molecule from this acid-base reaction, and it seems like we've generated the enolate, the ester enolate. But the question is this. In which direction is this equilibrium biased towards? The pKa of ethanol is roughly 16, and the pKa of the ester molecule, like we discussed, is approximately 25. Acid-base equilibria generally favor formation of the weaker acid. Well, the weaker of these two acids is clearly the ester enolate by a factor of 9 pKa units. Remember, pKa is a log scale, so that is significant. Formation of the weaker acid would mean the equilibria really lies towards this direction and not so much in the forward direction. So that's one consideration here. The ethoxide, although it's a good base and the ideal base compared to hydroxide, well, there's a drawback, and that is not much enolate generation. So as we look at the mechanism, we want to discuss how we pull this reaction forward. So let's look at how the reaction works and try to answer these questions. All right, so here is step one of our mechanism. We're going to generate the enolate, and we discussed that ethoxide is the ideal base here. LDA would cause total deprotonation of this ester molecule, which would prevent self-reaction, which is sort of implied here. A mixed Kleisen wouldn't do that. Mixed Kleisen condensations involve two different distinct esters. Here we're doing a condensation within the ethyl acetate realm. 
so to speak. So here is our base, ethyl acetate. Here we can highlight the alpha protons. And what happens mechanistically is now ethoxide reaches out, donates the electron pair, plucks off the proton off of the alpha position, and we end up with this first resonance form here, where we have the lone pair shown on the alpha position. Of course, only two alpha hydrogens are left. Now, although esters aren't as acidic as aldehydes and ketones at the alpha position, the base is quite stabilized in terms of resonance. This is, after all, a carbon-hydrogen bond which is deemed acidic to the extent that we assign the pK or we observe the pK of 25. Carbon-hydrogen bonds are typically not very acidic. If you look at the ones in butane, the pK is close to 50. So the reason this space is actually quite stable is that the negative charge can be conjugated with adjacent electron withdrawing group. The simple way of saying that is the negative charge can be delocalized. And the way we can show that, at least in one resonance form, is to transfer the lone pair, that forms a new pi bond, and as a result, the carbonyl breaks and takes on three lone pairs, whereas previously it had two. So these are the three lone pairs here. The charge has been transferred from the alpha carbon here to the carbonyl carbon. Now part of the reason aldehydes and ketones are more acidic than esters has to do with the structure of the ester itself. The ester always has this alcohol component here, whether it's you know, the ethoxy group or the methoxy group, there's always the alcohol component of the ester, and this is considered an electron donating group. In this case, the ethoxy group has two lone pairs that can be conjugated with the carbonyl as well. So in other words, we can generate this resonance form by the electron donation of the group itself. So what happens is one of the lone pairs on this oxygen here can mobilize itself form a partial bibond right here, and as a result, break the carbonyl. That's how we arrive at this resonance form here. Which means the electron donating alpha carbon has competition. You don't see that with all the heads and ketones. The negative charge from the alpha position isn't as extensively delocalized as you see with all the heads and ketones. So in fact, the lone pair is still here, and so is the charge. So what we've done is we've successfully generated the enolate. Now we can use the enolate. And that's the next step. Now here's step two of the reaction. Here's the enolate that we just generated from the ethoxide deprotonation. Here's the alpha lone pair. And what happens now is the lone pair can reach out to the carbonyl carbon of another ethyl acetate molecule. Remember that this is primarily a predominant structure here. We don't generate much ester enolate, but upon generating it, it's consumed it attaches onto another ester molecule. And the pi bond of the carbonyl gives way. So we generate a tetrahedral intermediate that is charged. The former carbonyl here has a negative charge. So we end up with this compound. Now it's very easy to get lost. This is a small compound, relatively speaking, ethyl acetate, that uh, is sort of, let's say, dimerizing. It's connecting with itself. It's forming a four carbon compound from two individual two carbon components. Well, we'll see examples of the Claisen condensation where that isn't the case. We have larger molecules, far more complex, and it's hard to keep track of all the carbons. One method is to count all the carbons. There's no losing track then. But at the minimum, we should label the alpha position and track the alpha carbon throughout the entire reaction. We understand the alpha carbon is bound to the original ester of this nucleophile, and the alpha carbon is forming a new bond with the carbonyl carbon of another ester. So that is this black bond right here. It's the connection between alpha and the former carbonyl. Now in the case of the aldo condensation, we didn't have this leaving group present here like we do with esters. It would be rather a hydrogen or some R group, and the next step of the reaction would be protonation of this oxygen. We can't do that here. The mechanism is different. It's nucleophilic acyl substitution. So now, just like with acyl substitution mechanisms, the lone pair that is present on the former carbonyl position collapses. And that can be shown with this electronic movement. The carbonyl regenerates, and as a result, we can boot out the leaving group, in this case, the ethoxide leaving group. So that gives rise to the ethoxide anion. We can fill in the three lone pairs, whereas previously it was the alcohol component, only two. 
one pairs. We've generated the carbonyl, which is shown like here, and this is the result. We have the beta keto ester. Here's carbon one, here's the alpha carbon, and here's the beta carbon. We can't forget the two hydrogens on the alpha position, so let's highlight those protons. Here's the trouble. We don't generate much ester enolate. Upon generating just a little bit, it's consumed. It starts to react with untouched enolate, or I should say untouched ester. So small formation of ester enolate starts to react with neutral ester, and we generate this tetrahedral intermediate that eventually collapses, and we expel this ethoxide leaving group. Not the best leaving group at all. The negative charge on this oxygen is simply put stuck. It's not resonance stabilized, it's quite reactive. This is a good base. It's not like a chloride anion, for example, which is far more stabilized than the ethoxide. So one way this ethoxide base can stabilize itself is by deprotonating an acidic hydrogen, the ones that are attached to the alpha position. That's the next step. Remove one of the alpha protons here. In one resonance form, we can transfer the carbon-hydrogen electrons that are left behind back to the alpha position, which would give rise to a lone pair. We can show that right here. Step four is this critical step. It drives the Claisen condensation forward and is irreversible. Why is that? Well, let's take a look. Here we had two alpha hydrogens. Now we just have one. So this would be our complete resonance form. Let's call this contributor one. The idea is this. Whereas previously with the esters, we had another alpha position that wasn't very acidic. We mentioned the pKa was roughly 25. Let's say these protons out here. But as the Claisen condensation progresses, we end up with an alpha carbon that's sandwiched between two carbonyls. The product of the Claisen condensation is a beta keto ester, and that's an example of a 1,3 dicarbonyl. The 1,3 compounds have this alpha carbon directly in the middle of two electron withdrawing groups that are flanking the alpha position. That makes these protons far more acidic, and there's a resonance reason for that. The negative charge has formed as a result of the lone pair being placed on the alpha position. But this lone pair can conjugate with both carbonyls like we discussed. Let's say it goes towards the left, quote unquote. Let's say we mobilize the lone pair here, and we start feeding this carbonyl carbon electrons and start to involve it in a pi bond, which we see here. Well, then something has to give way, and it would be the carbonyl. So we end up with a negatively charged oxygen. Here's my former alpha position. Here's the one hydrogen that's still there. What I've done here is moved the negative charge from the alpha position to another position. We've delocalized the charge. That stabilizes this conjugate base even more. So here's form two. Now, is it true that we can mobilize the lone pair towards the right? Absolutely. And that's also observed here in this resonance form. The lone pair can be conjugated with the carbonyl of the original ester compound. So what we do is send the negative charge from the alpha position to the oxygen of the other carbonyl. So the conclusion is this. The more stable the base, the more reactive the acid. So the penultimate product of the Claisen condensation is yet again another enolate. And we've generated ethanol, which was the former leaving group. This is why we need to acidify in the second step of the Claisen condensation. So we have four mechanistic steps that allows for the attachment of two different esters. But we always end up with an enolate that has to be acidified. We have this lone pair on the alpha position that's hungry for protons, and that's the final step of the mechanism. We introduce dilute hydrochloric acid. In this case, let's use hydrochloric acid in the mechanism. Here's my lone pair. Here's my negative charge. And here is the acidification. We previously had two alpha hydrogens. One was removed by the leaving group, so we only have one left. But hydrochloric acid will remedy that. We generate the chloride anion. And more importantly, we've restored our beta keto ester with no charges. It seems kind of stupid. We had two alpha hydrogens. Then we went to one. Now we have two again. The idea is we can't control it. The leaving group is far too strong as a base to be controlled. So it comes back in and removes an alpha proton.